TIE Fighters are always changing to meet the needs of their time. What's up, Nerds? This video will break down the new Outlander TIE Fighter. We'll see why this design makes sense for a fractured Inferior Remnant, and even some cool behind-the-scenes facts on how this almost appeared in The Force Awakens. Of course, like all TIE variants, it retains a lot of the key looks and features of the TIE LN, but the most obvious changes are these S-foil folding wings. But why this change? Well, it's important to understand that the TIE Fighter was designed with an assumed infrastructure around them. It's cheaper to just build the hangar racks and specialized landing pad equipment once, and have all of that safely on a base or a carrier, instead of building landing gear into each of the countless TIEs pumped out over the decades. The sad truth was that TIE Fighters were disposable. Those were the things getting blown up. It's much cheaper to build these permanent catwalk structures and Star Destroyers and Death Stars, or just have a simple set of stairs on wheels that you can roll into place. This low cost, just three times a Vulture Droid, and less than half an X-Wing, allowed them to be pumped out at such a rate that any destroyed by Rebels would be quickly and effortlessly replaced, which had a very demoralizing effect. They are famously weak, and there were even popular TIE Fighter slogans like, No Shields, All Guts. But I think there's some strong evidence that the Outlander TIE was upgraded. When the Mando latches onto the TIE, it seems like he thought he could just fire through the glass. It would be odd if he didn't think that this was transparent steel. He must have some reason to think that this would work, so perhaps this tie was reinforced. If not, I think that certainly the hull was reinforced. One is simply the fact that a moth wouldn't be riding around in a flimsy TIE Fighter of the line, just too risky. And proof of this is that these two explosives don't set the whole TIE Fighter ablaze. It doesn't even sever the wing, it just blows apart some of the top half. As if it didn't penetrate the whole armor, but instead the blast was directed up and outward, and tore up the more fragile Solar Collector array. You also get a glimpse at a really useful detection method new to this model, which shows you when something is placed on the hull, and most likely would have provided other damage reports and tactical information. As the tie falls to the ground, we see that apparently the ejector seat mechanism was removed. Perhaps this was done to clear out some room for the landing gear. Interestingly, the three legs of this landing gear, two to the sides and one out the rear, are very similar to those of the X-Wing. Some speculate that this, combined with the S-foils, which bring its landed position into this X-shape, may point to the Outland TIE being a retrofit that incorporated some X-Wing parts, perhaps captured by Imperial Remnant forces. That or Incom Corporation had worked with Sinar Fleet Systems to create this variant. Incom originally made the X-Wings for the Empire, so I could see this being the case. Shields and hyperdrives are often the most expensive parts of a ship, and so your standard TIE fighter has neither. And although those might be useful, I don't see any evidence to think that this variant has any either. We don't know for sure how large a force the Moth has, but he must at least have some large transports, if not a capital ship. There's various troops like regular stormtroopers, scout troopers, and death troopers, and even vehicles like speeder bikes and ITTs, all of which points to some sort of carrier. And so this Outlander TIE may still just be a short-range fighter. But remember, the TIE LN was never supposed to be setting down on strange terrain. They were most often in escort and patrol roles, with only occasionally ever engaging enemies. Once the Empire was killed and that well-oiled war machine started to fracture, things had to change. The TIE still had good firepower and excellent speed, so they were still really valuable. But now you would need TIEs that could land on worlds that you wanted to bring under your particular rule, as Imperial Warlords took a more direct role in holding on to regional power. So hopefully you see how these small changes really do make a big difference in a time of a fractured empire. As for the behind the scenes facts, I just wanted to point out that there is some mechanism that lifts him out of the cockpit for dramatic flair. And conveniently, we don't see him actually do the less graceful slide off onto the ground. Also, this design was first seen in concept art for The Force Awakens, created by the amazing Doug Chang, who is responsible for a lot of the best stuff of the prequels. Stuff like the Naboo Starfighter and Pod Racers. And in this episode, we saw that of course the Darksaber, a form of lightsaber, can cut through the hull. Which would be true even if it has the thicker hull plating that I think it has. And this is connected to Gideon's past on Mandalore. He was in the Imperial Security Bureau and helped with the Siege of Mandalore, and later would become the Marshal of Mandalorian space. So that's it for the Outlander tie. If you want to connect with us on social media, find ways that you can help support our channel without it costing you a thing, or check out our Patreon, be sure to check out the links in the description. Special shout out to our supporters over on Patreon, but most important of all, remember, if this really is a combo of TIE Fighter and X-Wing, then it has brought balance to the Starfighters. And the Force will be with you, always.